this is this is some artwork we did. Oh, okay. Um, Bernie Vonnegut. And, yeah. And, 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 uh, yeah, but about you know, just the general language. idea that people couldn't change the climate. That most people don't even realize that's something that can happen yeah. with geoengineering and things like that. So of course it's just a little infographic. Now, and, and I don't want to bore you with all this, but but basically what we're proposing is is something called the Environmental Modification Accountability Act. Yeah, I think I saw it on. Yeah, and and, 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 and yeah, and the gen, yeah, and the general idea is. If the CIA is asking Alan Robot, if Russia was modifying our weather, would we know? And his answer to them is probably. And then Diane Seidel, who was here last last conference, saying, we cannot detect rogue geoengineering. From a public perception, this is a this is a national security concern. Would you agree with that? I mean that the potential is there. Well, I, I, I agree that uh, I was involved in a 2015 report called Climate Intervention. Mm -hmm. two the volume, NAS part. Two so. volume account uh, from the uh, National Academies of Science. Yes, sir. And uh, one of the sponsors was the National Security Agencies who wanted to know uh, do we have the capability to detect uh, climate mm -hmm. modification? or to counter, say, a rogue nation that might yeah. want to engage in it. Yes, sir. So, so one, of the, uh, not, one of the angles was not just, is the technology viable, which is a pretty fraught question. Yeah, it is. But the, uh, the angle was, do we have enough satellite information and sensitivity to know the real or the natural versus the modified climate? I agree, I agree with that. And that's, I don't, I don't know if you know about my activism, but I spoke at an EPA hearing on flight pollution in 2015. And what I said to them was, they were trying to regulate CO2 emissions from planes. And I said to them, well, radiation balance budget-wise, I think you should be more concerned about cloud creation. And what we have is a situation where the public would see chemtrails and they want to be scared because there's so much fear, uncertainty, and doubt associated with all the stuff put out on the internet that there are a lot of people who are very scared. And then I realize, uh, excuse me, I read vice.com, climate scientists are giving death threats. That's unacceptable. So we have a situation where there's an industry that creates fear associated with this, but the government really can't prove otherwise. And that's a scary situation. I mean, honestly, just from me to you, where, what I see as a problem is the, the sensor problem is a serious problem, but more so the transparency issue is a problem for me. Going through 200 years of history, trying to get it in chronological order, trying to do the stuff we're doing so that we can end that mysterious nature. Um, even just now, I talked to the people from the Naval Research Lab, I said, can we talk about ionospheric heating? Because I have questions, like honest questions. The public relations lady said, I'm not allowed to talk about that is not acceptable. Um, so for us, we're, we're trying to basically give NMOD some teeth. And I want to use history as a way to do that. And, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, Operation Popeye happened. And because of the disclosure by Jack Anderson and Claiborne Pell that we had first the Weather Modification Reporting Act of 72 was passed, because basically Congress people were like, we control the weather, and we should probably know when we do that. So that was the NOAA law. And then the Policy Act of 76 followed by the NMOD Convention in 78. So what we did was we basically said, everybody in America needs to tell us when they're modifying the weather, but it's still not public. I mean, it goes to NOAA, and I've turned those into maps and with a lot of effort. But there's still no transparency or accountability for any climate engineering, let alone cloud seeding on a local basis. Um, when I emailed David Keith about this, he agreed that a 48-hour notice is not only acceptable, but maybe too little. But what I think that is, if we have a world meteorological organization on the, the expert team on weather modification, and they keep records somewhat on global cloud seeding projects that you know, Dr. James Lee from American EDU said the same thing I'm saying. We need to get a registry going. So, what do you think is... I, I, I've, I've put my solutions out there. You being the historian that you are, what do you think is a credible solution for, for transparency? Well, I'm, I'm a historian of science and technology. And I interact with the people. And uh, I have to be uh, 
honest that I don't have any uh, privileged insights into what the military is doing or even what the politics cutting edge is right now. But I try to use history to inform enlightened public policy. And, and what you said was basically true, that the, the U.S. was not only modifying the weather over Vietnam, but they were using Agent Orange yeah. and they were doing the, the cookie cutter bombs yeah. and they were bombing the rice paddies. I have, I have a photo of that. Yeah. Right here, the cold cloud the modification bombs. system. That's a China Lake uh, U.S. Navy cold cloud bomb. Yeah, yeah. but so, so uh, we got caught up in a enthusiasm in the 1960s and 70s. Yeah. And it was really a top secret between the President and the Secretary of Defense. Um, even lower military people didn't know about the project. Well, from, from what I understand, and you can correct me on this too, the CIA and Henry Kissinger ran the program. And they did it through the U.S. Navy and U.S. Air Force without ever informing um, Secretary of Defense Laird, Melvin Laird. Is that correct? Well, I'm not sure about the details. Yeah. But it was a, really a need-to-know, very small group that was keeping it not proprietary knowledge. That the base commander in Thailand who had the airplanes didn't know exactly what was going on. That is amazing. So the people were told to deliver ordnance and come back to base. Wow. And then without uh, verification or measurements they made claims about success mm -hmm. and then it got caught up as you said in the, in the Congress uh, it was in the press it was um, about the time of Gerald Ford's uh, caretaker presidency okay. after Nixon had resigned and so uh, they went to the UN and became a public embarrassment for the US and we were actually a nation that would consider environmental warfare as a weapon and so it's not that the cloud seeding itself was the problem, it was the militarization of it, yeah, exactly. the attempt to use it for hostile purposes. Mm -hmm. And so the NMOD treaty, uh, it does have uh, some teeth that it could trigger a uh, national secu or a, a security, UN security uh, council meeting. Mm -hmm. It could, never has. That's, that's, what, that's my issue. But there, there are, there are uh, <coughs> meetings of the parties, they have had at least two since the 70s, that looked at does the treaty need to be updated, does it need to be and so I, I would hope that they would continue to have those kinds of discussions now in the era we're in. Yeah. And, and in my personal opinion, with the kind of technology that we have now versus the 70s, the impetus should be greater for transparency. And I think that it all rides on the word hostile, because hostile is an intent. And an intent is hard to prove, especially in the court of law, without the preponderance of evidence. And we don't have evidence because we don't have censors. Well, there, there was two phrases in the treaty. One was called hostile, the other was hard scale. Yeah, and long so, lasting. And long lasting. And so uh, a lot of people have said, well, what we're doing is not long lasting. It's just making a rain shower. And we, we don't have hostile intent. But still, the effect of that uh, time period was to cancel uh, public federal programs in weather control. Mm -hmm. And so the weather. Project Skywater, things like yeah, that. Yeah, the, the weather control has gone into regional and local. Uh, Water, water management districts. The, the Bureau of Reclamation still runs them, um, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture just did an electrified water test over Texas this year. So, and they were using a, a guy from Monsanto and a Mon Monsanto pesticide sprayer to electrify water over Texas. They got an exemption for it. TLDR had their meeting that was online, and I shared it on Facebook. After making a bunch of comments, they removed comments from the video because it got out of hand. But regardless, the government is still involved in weather modification. They are funding it still. But there's no honesty, there's no transparency about it, and that still concerns me. Um, the, the, the guys who do the ionospheric modifications, when the Navy, U.S. Naval Research Lab, who I just talked to, said they were going to do this, they said, well, we're only making a plasma fireball in space for five minutes. That's not long-lasting. The only difference between long-lasting and an NMOD violation is, are we at war? Because we can obviously do this for five minutes, we can do it all day. And Harry Wexler warned, as you so well pointed out, that punching holes in the ionosphere and using sounding rockets can change the global climate in ways that we don't understand. So I think we're in a situation where sounding rockets are used every single day. Um, I'm actually in the process of mapping out all of them from 1950 to present. I got a list, finally. Um, so we're gonna map them all out and look at it as a whole. But 
I think that with the technologies we have, how often they're used, the size and scope of it, just having cloud seeding generators that run the entire gamut of the Rocky Mountains all on same time, October to March of every year, it's no longer just a regional thing. That, well, and I could I'll be wrong about story. that. I once asked a famous uh, climatologist and chaos theorist at Lorenz. Mm -hmm. I asked him about the butterfly effect. Yeah. I asked him could a butterfly in Brazil actually cause a tornado in Texas. And I, and I said to him, I said, well, and how, how big would a butterfly effect have to be in perturbation? He said, uh, with a, kind of a twinkle in his eye, he said, about as big as the Rocky Mountains, which would be a planetary perturbation. Yeah. So kind of like I say, a, a new Rossby wave okay. generated by human activity. And so I, I playfully started calling it the Mothra, the giant <laughs> The giant butterfly. So okay. he, the, the, the answer that I would give is that, that we're dealing with things that we don't know. Uh, the climate scientists that want to get involved in climate intervention talk about the minimus, the smallest intervention to study what they want to study. But nobody knows what the minimal intervention really is. So we had a short-term intervention in the planet in 1962. It was the H-bomb in the magnetosphere. Starfish. It was called Starfish Prime. And it led to a 10-year disruption of the magnetosphere. It was, it was probably a few microseconds of intense blast and then the results of the radiation. And the artificial radiation belts that were created. So, so James Van Allen regretted the test. He was also an enthusiastic addition about studying the Vegas topic, bell yeah. ringing. Um, yeah. But that was a purely middle military project to try to knock out communications. The, the Christophilos effect. During a time of, yeah. a, of, of a national emergency. But, but and, today uh, they're still doing that. And there's Dr. Jacob Bortnick from the, uh, the University of Alaska who says we want to remove the Van Allen belt. That's scary. Well, to that's, me. that's outlined. That's an outline. I hope that that's it. That, but from, from, you've got to understand from the public. We don't have the inside scoop on who's cool and who isn't, and who people listen to and who they don't. All we hear is a guy who's at the University of Alaska that runs the HARP program saying, we want to destroy the Van Allen belts and we don't know that there's any downside to not having them. And that kind of attitude is dangerous when we're talking about the type of technology that we have today. And really, there's no accountability for anybody. If they were to do those experiments, we wouldn't know until after the fact. I, I think there's a real important role to play in this. And, and there was a, a movement to ban uh, atmospheric nuclear testing after Starfish Prime. Part of it was a run up to fall out of the The limited Rye. test ban And, and that, that was stimulated very much after 62, I think, after 63. Mm -hmm. And so there was a public outcry. The astronomer of Warland got involved. Very prominent people agreed mm -hmm. that we were doing things that were beyond our ken. Yeah. And so uh, I, I think that there's a role to keep this accountability there. I, I would uh, argue for a, a longer warning period. I agree. Public, but, uh, uh, and I, I originally started with 30 days, something like that, but Obama tried to regulate the coal industry, and all of it was thrown out because it was too onerous. And I'm trying to get something that can realistically happen. And it's a three-step solution, State Department, UN Security Council, it's an addendum to NMOD, it's a law. That's pretty simple. All I want to do here is get people like you and scientists who understand the technology, understand the ramifications, and have the weight behind the enemy to go with. I don't know about the weight. I, well, the, uh, they'll listen to you before they'll listen to me, is my point. So, honestly... Well, I, I know that certain things happen in history, and I don't have any security yeah. what's going on now. But I do know that there is a need to know kind of hierarchy and they won't have everybody in the weather service or in the military weather service is knowing exactly what's happening. Compartmentalization so is always a problem. And you know, like what I talked to the Naval Research Club, we cannot talk about this. That's unacceptable. And the reason they cannot talk about it is because if you can do it for five minutes, you can do it all day. Just this five minute thing doesn't mean that you're not violating in my and to be very specific, it says military or hostile weather modification. So technically, NMOD bans all military weather modification. Not um, there's temporary a or long-lasting. There's a conference here. I think you might be 
part of it is the uh, weather modification section. The 21st conference of the yeah. I'm going to that. That's why I'm here. So there, there's some big things happening tomorrow. I want to talk to Alan Robot tomorrow. Very you, should, bad. you should talk to Bill Cotton. Too. Bill Co William Cotton is going to be here. I just interviewed him for our project. So, so the hurricane to controller himself. Well, right? you should talk to Bill. Yeah, I he would was love in, to talk He was to involved him. in Storm Fury yeah. and stuff like that. I, I've, I've got his presentation from 2008 on the website. Okay. So yeah, he um, he talked about doping jet fuel, something that the chemtrail people online are very fascinated by. I'd like to throw this one at you real quick. Okay. What I found, and I'll show this to them at home That's as well. We'll get that later. Yeah, we'll, we'll get a shot of that. But, no, we'll get it later. But basically... I talked to the head of the FAA, and he said we want to make clouds by day on Monday. Alder Chung from the ICAO said we want less warming, more cooling time trail. And in order to do that, they came up with a two jet fuels and one tank to control time trail production. It's sulfuric, um, it's a sulfate, you know, sulfate basically. Earth. So David Key talked about photophoretic levitation of black carbon um, soot. Oh, sure. So what's going on here is soot comes out the back of the plane and it goes up. Metal frees itself from the soot, creates cirrus clouds. Clarifying the dominant source of soot fog creates 75% of their cloud seeds were man made metals. So, man made metals come out of soot, soot keeps going up. Indian Space Organization last month said they found carbon black soot from airplanes at 18 kilometers past the ozone layer. And they claimed that jet aircraft emissions were affecting their monsoon and destroying ozone. So, what David Keith and all these geoengineers have been proposing all this time was to put sulfur into the stratosphere, which planes have been doing for years on end. Oscar Escobar, another guy, um, I wrote, got his paper on the website. He said that stratospheric sulfur um, levels are higher than what David Keith want already. So when the public's going, we're calling it geoengineering because my day started blue. Planes came over. I cannot see the sun anymore. It happens every single day. They want to continue to call it inadvertent, but in my personal opinion, come 2010, all that changed. It is no longer inadvertent, and it is intentional. There's a clear plan. I went to the FAA or the EPA thing to talk about it. The ICAO signed an agreement with Obama on the alternative fuel pack, and they're looking to use biofuels for contrail control. That is geoengineering circumventing the convention for biological diversity. And well, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in the documents. I have to send I will, I'll them. be glad to send them to you. I don't want to bug you about it. Because I, just want to I, I out can't, I can't speak to the chemtrails yeah. ideas right now. So yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to take up any more of your time, and I appreciate you doing well, this very much. Um, yeah. uh, I do think that uh, there needs to be a, uh, a serious look at this. Uh, the academy. Uh, tried to look at it. Their, their final report was that uh, uh, mitigation of uh, carbon emissions and adaptation to climate change are the best policies now. Mm -hmm. That intervention, we, uh, I was actually the person involved in getting the report named climate intervention because it's really not engineering. Okay. It was more too speculative. And, and I think that, uh, that we need to uh, give documentation to things that we're worried about. Yeah. Uh, that's what I do. I work on documentary history. Yeah. So and I, you do it better than anybody. Well, I, I'll try, but I, I am thinking of a new uh, update to my book, Fixing the Sky, and it might be more 21st century focus on things that have happened more recently. Well, I would love for you to cover the CubeSats and how they, the reason they sold Heart was because they have ionospheric gears on satellites. And they have, they call them top side sounders and all these other things, but they are injecting BLF and ELF in space to modify space weather. They dump chemical trails with oh, sounding space rockets. Weather, uh, so it's space now, weather the, modification. The other, the other technology that I'm, I'm really kind of concerned about is uh, the identification of cirrus clouds, the thin ice clouds, as being uh, warming agents for the planet, so we need to get rid of them. Yeah. Now, cirrus clouds are not just agents of climate warming, they're beautiful. Uh, the natural cirrus are wispy and they provide uh, support for lower level precipitation mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And I studied cirrus clouds when I was in atmospheric science and I, I wouldn't like to see any part of the world just become an object of uh, control just for our, our CO2 excesses and yeah, for right. global warming concerns. And that seems to be the, 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 the plan right now is to take advantage of cirrus clouds because they're cooling during the day 
but cirrus cloud seeding or thinning during the night and or zapping them with lasers to blast them out of the sky at night so that earth radiation management can occur and heat can escape back into space. Yeah. Um, I've studied, I made a page called Cirrus Clouds Map for all the people who talk about chemtrails so that they understand that when a linear contrail fans out it becomes a cirrus cloud and those matter. And honestly, the chemtrail word has so much hate attributed to it that simply using it, people assume things about you. It polarizes. It is very polarizing. So I think that we should have an honest conversation my, about my the geoengineering My master's thesis series. was on zero, I guess you'd call it zero stratus, the, the big anvils off the top of tropical clouds, off which really the do, they do as much uh, in the heating budget at high altitude as does the... Uh, the rain and the, and the ice phases. Mm -hmm. and so it w wasn't known at the time, but the radiative effects of cirrus clouds are really quite profound. Yeah. But uh, I think the clouds are quite profound, and they do what they do for the, for the system. Uh, making uh, the, uh, part of the, uh, just finish up by talking about artificial volcanoes, because uh, Mount Pinatubo erupted, which began a cycle of this geoengineering discussion. And we could make an artificial volcano. And that was with Edward Teller, um, Roger Kide, Lowell Wood, and Tim Caldera, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, right? Right, it came out of a national lab <coughs> idea, but uh, uh, Mike McCracken did his thesis on this. And then Crutzen was like, and, this and so, is good. <laughs> but uh, the historical point I'd like to make is that there is a chapter or a section of James Espy's 19, 1841 book, The Philosophy of Storms. And it, it, it deals with making an artificial volcano or the effect of volcanoes on weather. I haven't heard that. So the, 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 uh, and he wanted to burn the forest to make yeah, it. I heard that. So I his, his small-scale artificial volcano they expect in 1840. It, I'll just it, leave it history, that. history is history fascinating. Matters. Yeah, history is fascinating. Yeah. James Roger Fleming is the world's top historian on geoengineering and weather modification. Please check out his book, Fixing the Sky, The Checkered History of Weather Modification. Of weather and climate weather control. And, there you go. Weather and climate control. I was close. Um, but this is the man. I really appreciate you doing this interview. And I look forward to you knowing you a lot. Okay. You're my hero. Keep in touch. Definitely. Thank you, guys. Jim Lee Thank Climate Your News and the man, Jim Fleming. If this video resonates with you, leave me a comment because I love hearing from you all. First time here? Be sure to subscribe and click the bell. The bell doesn't always work, so come to climateviewer.com and sign up for our newsletter. Remember, it would be impossible for me to do this without your support, so please join my Patreon or buy me a coffee on PayPal. And always, attack ideas, not people.